Okay, so it's worth five. Uh, the was one penny. I think we said the code was about one penny US. Uh, and that was a Cubano bus, so we, there were not any tourists on the bus where we went, but it was perfectly great. It took us right to where we needed to go as far as school. Yeah. And they were, they were big buses, they were maybe the size of our articulated buses that we have here. And I tell you, you get on a, a bus at 7.30, 8 o'clock in the morning, there'd be 200 people on that bus. I mean, it was really intensely crowded, but it was, it was kind of a, a, a pretty wonderful experience to see everybody get on the bus and go to work and so on. It was quite pleasing. Okay. Um, Cuba has a very interesting, wonderful, and conflicted history. <coughs> Cuba has been uh, in the headlines off and on during most of my lifetime. Uh, and today, Cuba is still going to be on the headlines because if you're paying any attention at all to what's going on in Venezuela right now, uh, there's going to be a lot of, of, a lot of fallout from that because Cuba is highly dependent on Venezuela for oil. And we know that if Trump people get in power in Venezuela, we know what's going to happen to that oil. So Cuba may be in a very, very deep economic crisis again. But just briefly, in 1991, the Soviet Union collapsed. The Soviet Union had been a patron of sorts, uh, aid to Cuba for 30 years at that point. And when that happened, everybody said, well, because Cuba was dependent on the sale of its sugar to Russia, and Russia gave them, you know, good prices and so on, that the revolution was going to fail, that, you know, it was all over. The exports and imports declined 80% in one year, right? And actually, hunger actually was a problem there in 91 and 92. Uh, but the predictions about the revolutionary Cuba will fall. Well, it didn't happen that way. But people will talk about it because now in Cuba, you know, it, it, there are things that people are unhappy with and people want to switch. But one thing that's absolutely apparent is there is not malnutrition in Cuba. I mean, there really isn't. And, so no matter how far out of town you go, or how rural it is, or how, um, you know, how little money people have, they always have food, right? And so they talk about this special period in the early 90s when food was actually an issue and was a problem. And, and although Cuba, uh, Cuba has very little crime, even Havana has very little crime, you see some downstairs apartments with bars, and I would argue, why do you have those bars? They said they left over from special period when people were so hungry and um, we had actually theft which they don't really have now. Okay. Uh, Troubled history just very briefly. Uh, Cuba was established as a protectorate in the United States in 1901. What does that mean when I say it was a protectorate? Cuba, the Cuban constitution in 1901 had a provision that gave the United States permission to intervene in Cuban affairs any time it wanted to. That was called the Platt Amendment, and they did. You know, they occupied the Marines off and on, and so on and so forth. Uh, and but in 1926, Fidel Castro was born. And the thing we can say about Fidel, more than anything else, is that he was a Cuban nationalist as a very young guy uh, in his teens. He came to this, this distinct kind of conclusion that Cuba belonged to the Cubans, not to the Americans, and, and he spent the rest of his life kind of operating on that principle. And of course, eventually, he, he became a communist too, and, and brought that into his nationalism, right? Um, and he and Che Guevara uh, and some other folks led the Cuban Revolution in 1959, and from that point forward. Uh, Cuba has been for Cuba, and the people that live there essentially are in charge of their own lives. Uh, immediately after the revolution, U.S. and Cuba clash over corporate control of large sectors of the Cuban economy. This happened, this was the Eisenhower administration, then into the Kennedy administration, and essentially what the Cubans did was they started to nationalize and expropriate large American corporations, companies, sugar holdings, and so on. And of course, the U.S. didn't like that at all. And what, Cuba, what, what happened was the United States broke diplomatic relations with Cuba. 
and put in place a trade embargo, and uh, that's what 57 years 57 years ago, uh, and that embargo is still in effect. It's illegal for U.S. companies, corporations, etc., to do any kind of business whatsoever. They also have extensions of that law saying that other countries in the world can't sell stuff to Cuba if they're selling American products. But, I mean, they've got the they've got the heavy hand of the U.S. Treasury Department all over the world trying to make sure that Cuba doesn't get this or get that or so on, particularly things that are very hurtful to the Cuban economy, you know, our, our, our medicines and things like that. But it's still, it's still there. Okay? But not only hurtful to the, the, Ameri the Cuban population, but hurtful to the American population. So, I mean, I'm interested in health care because my, my background is in global health. And so one of the things I find just devastating is the Cubans have a cure for diabetic foot ulcer, right, which they use. They do not have foot amputations in diabetics. So if you've been around U.S. diabetic care at all, it's just full of people losing their toes and their feet. They have the cure. We are not allowed to access it. So if we were to access it, we would absolutely not be having that anymore, which is pretty dramatic. I mean, that our governments decided we shouldn't have something like that because they don't like Cuba. Well, uh, the, the early days of the chart here, the, the last three points here, you know, essentially the U.S. did everything they could to try to get rid of the Cuban Revolution, and including over 200 assassination attempts from Fidel Castro. Right? I mean, they did weird stuff. They, you know, Fidel liked to scuba dive, and they got divers to go down there and try to they could figure out how to put poison near the water or the fish, and they poisoned his cigars. They did all kinds of things, right? And that happened right up until the, to the end of the century. It wasn't like it just went away. But um, the thing that people hear a lot about is the Cuban Missile Crisis, right? Now, some of you in the room here remember that. Most of you don't. But it was a scary time, OK? So the, during the Cuban Missile Crisis, I think a lot of people in this country and elsewhere really thought that we were on the brink of nuclear war, right? But what people didn't really fully understand is that missile crisis happened because in 1961, the United States, with its Cuban allies, you know, former, former officials of the regime, tried to overthrow that revolution at the Bay of Pigs, and they were defeated, right? And the lesson that the Cubans and Fidel and, and all the leadership learned from that is, is, is that we need some allies in the world, we need to protect ourselves, and that's one of the major reasons that they ended up inviting the Soviets into the region, right? As sort of a protection against uh, US invasion. And when that whole thing ended after the 62 crisis, they got a, they got a, they, the Cubans actually got, a, got information from Cuba that they would agree to not invade Cuba, right? And so that hasn't necessarily been honored, but the Americans basically had to um, agree to the fact that they weren't going to invade Cuba. And, and that was what that was all about, that, that about Cuban sovereignty, Cuban independence. This picture is a portrait that comes from a museum where lots and lots of kids sent their portraits of Fidel after he died as a tribute. And so I, I like that one because he just looks so grouchy. <laughs> <laughs> Some of the kids' pictures, of course, were selected and they have them up in a gallery and it's pretty nice to see it. Everywhere you go, if you bring up Fidel, people have this amazing, amazing affection for him. It's really quite marked. The non-capitalist road to development is Cuba. 25 years after the dire prediction, Cuba has survived. Cubans are better educated and healthier than many people in the developed world and as a leader in the developing world. Today, food is abundant, transportation, daycare, and schools are everywhere. When I say non-capitalist road, we, that's what I mean. And, and what's really interesting is if you go around Cuba, 
you can still see people that, that you know look relatively poor compared to kind of our standards, but there's no poverty there. There's no poverty there. You'll see a, you'll see an occasional person in the street begging and stuff like that, but it's nothing like other cities in Latin America. I mean, people there have a level of equality that I have never experienced anywhere. And people in Cuba are aware of that, and they know that. Even people who are disgruntled and have arguments with the Communist Party about this or, or, or this or that, they basically like the Cuban model that's developed, right? And that is, it's not based on growth. All of the development models that the UN and other organizations put out is this whole notion, we've got to have growth, we've got to have growth. Well, what happens with growth? Well, we get more money every year. The question the Cubans have to face with, well, if we did that, who's going to benefit from that? Who's going to, who's going to benefit from the profits of this industry or that industry? Instead, what the Cubans have done is they've taken all the resources in the entire country and said, we're going to share them. I mean, I've traveled a lot in very poor places, and I was really shocked in Cuba to see that, you know, despite where people live, it doesn't matter how far into the countryside you go or into what kind of poor area of the city you go, everybody has indoor plumbing, electricity, um, you know, I would say 90% have air conditioning um, at this point. So everybody has a basic level, which is kind of food and clothes. And if you ask them about that, Cubans just look at you like, what are you talking about? You know, what do you, why? Why would we not have that? You know, it's interesting. And one little story I think is really interesting is that I was in a park one day trying to you know, practice my Spanish, talking to these six workers, and this you know, a big van pulled up with about eight people, and about six people got up and could tell it was a whole family. And so I asked the guys, I said, what's going on? He said, well, those people all live in Miami. I said, what are they doing? He said, well, they're coming here to get their free medical care. They come here once a year. So and Cubans have to deal with that situation. Medical system is obviously way better in Cuba than it is here. This picture is in Santa Clara, and I chose it because it is a kind of non-non-vehicular pedestrian mall in Santa Clara with all kinds of restaurants and ice cream shops and bakeries and stuff. And it's very fun to walk along there, and it just looks very developed. Okay, more of just what we talked about there. This is this is an article from the British paper, The Guardian. In 2011, Cuba development model that proved the doubters wrong. Cuba's unique approach to the eradication of extreme poverty sets it apart from other Latin American and Caribbean countries. But the challenge now is how it evolves. Okay. Since the revolution in 1959, Cuba has eradicated extreme poverty and improved citizens' health and literacy. Well, it is not an economic powerhouse that has succeeded in moving from misery to poverty with dignity. Unlike many of its Latin American <coughs> neighbors making it an interesting developing model. However, the author of this article says that Cuba must pursue wealth creation to expand jobs and strengthen the economy and applauds Raul Castro's decision to encourage small businesses. While the Cuban development model sh should evolve, wealth creation may introduce excessive foreign investment and increase in the quality in the region. Sorry for all those words, but what they're getting at here is this whole thing about how you develop a society. You do it through capitalist growth, or you do it through a distribution system, right? Um, and the fundamental instinct at the heart of Cuba's revolution in 1959 was that slower wealth creation and limited political repression were a price worth paying for a fairer distribution and the consequent eradication of extreme poverty. It may have not been articulated as such, but that is how it's played out. Okay? Yeah, one of the most interesting conversations I had with my teacher was we were talking about, you know, this uh -huh. stuff. And, and so I said, you know, for a poor country, and she went, Cuba is not a poor country. That is just your scale that you use to measure things. We don't think Cuba is a poor country, and it isn't a poor country. And so, and, and then I kind of thought about that, and then as I traveled around, talked to lots of people, the one thing I noticed is everybody who's under 35 in Cuba wants to travel. That's the one thing they talk about is, 
look, we really want to go see what it's like other places, you know. And we're not a poor country, so we feel like we should get enough money enough that we can do that. Because on Cuban salaries, even if you're a professor, that would be virtually impossible. You can live in Cuba, but to actually travel and go somewhere as a, as a tourist would be really hard as a traveler. Um, there's, there's so many different kinds of things we can say about this, but it's just, it's kind of hard to process Cuba when you think about what we're, what we're used to here and the way we see people and so on. And it just, the, the phrase I pulled from this art, Guardian article, I think is very appropriate. It says, the Cubans are into, quote, just getting by, right? And you probably have been in that kind of situation yourself where you're just getting by, right? But that's fantastically better than a society where 50% of the people are getting along very, very well and the other 50% are in dire poverty, right? There's no dire poverty there. Things are, things are spread out, and, but everybody gets by. I don't know if it would make sense to people here, but I thought it was kind of fun when I was in June last year in the summer when Paraguay was declared the second malaria-free country in Latin America. You know, and they were all excited, everyone was all excited about 2018, right? Cuba was declared malaria-free in 1973, so yeah. And, and the medical system was developed in Cuba way back in the, the 60s. It was essentially designed by Che Guevara. He was a, he was a physician. Um, in fact, the Elon, the Latin American School of Medicine, was, was basically his, his uh, brainchild has been in existence for over 17 years. Okay. Um, yeah, so, I mean, one of the things that's happening in Cuba that's really interesting is everyone is talking about the Constitution because they're in the process of constitutional reform. It's, it, it's, it's hard for us to kind of reflect on that because, you know, there's some things in our Constitution we might like to reform. Right? We don't have that option. So, but the Cubans are doing constitutional reform and so people have these meetings all the time of different groups that come up with constitutional reform um, ideas and there's a whole process by which that information gets filtered through um, and that was all going on while we were there and so people it was on people's minds and people were talking about it um, and of course now it's it's done right yeah there's a, a vote on February 24th on there's a referendum on the new constitution <laughs> but what's what's really interesting is I think is that Every community in Cuba is involved in the discussion about what this constitution should be. And I don't mean like just two or three people in this city or that. I mean, we're talking hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and thousands of people all over the country are participating in creating this new constitution. It's, it's really pretty, pretty amazing. Thing. And some of the things that they are really interested in, you know, uh, I, I was a little bit surprised to hear from young Cubanos that that's what they're interested in because Cuba has so much art, performing art, music, visual art, there's just art places everywhere and available to everyone and constantly engaging young folks and they said yeah that's that's all very nice but we want to have where we can actually sell our art you know and make money from it so but that was really interesting. And some interesting points here. Cuba's draft constitution omits the aim of building communism. I think they're no longer interested in the debate about whose communism is better, right? Or which communist system is best, or so on. So they're, they're kind of being a little ambiguous about it. They're absolutely dedicated to creating a socialist society, whether it would, it would be a you know, a form that's closer to something that happened 30 years ago, I, I doubt it, okay? That was very much. Okay. And the next one thing, this is very important. This, this, this impacts Cuba in ways that everybody who's been to Cuba and followed it for a long time says that Cuba now recognizes private property rights, okay? 
and and that's reflected in many ways. So you can do Airbnb now, right? Okay. But if you're going to be an Airbnb person in Cuba, you can only have two units, right? So what they're doing is they're saying we're going to use private property and we're going to use the market, but what we're really worried about is the accumulation of capital by one person getting too much. So they're they're having they're accepting investment now and and they're giving the rights to private property. And but and the people are kind of going with it. If you go all over Cuba now, all over Havana at least, and Santa Clara and and some other places we saw, there are little market stands everywhere. There's just food and goods in the street and now there's a there's a huge art mart right across from from the the residence where we stayed, right? I mean where they're selling all kinds of art and everything. It's like people are selling stuff and it was quite a bit different from the last, I was there 10 years ago, and that was before these laws began to change, and there weren't very many corner markets or little stands. So you can go, you can make a right turn and go down the street this way, and they're running the onions and garlic. And you make a left turn, and you go this way, you'll find a yogurt stand, and you know, and so on and so forth. You can, you can get everything you need there, and they have a, they have a monetary system that's set up. So anyone that uh, has, any kind of connection to reality at all is, is not going to start because everybody's entitled to a, a basic salary. They're entitled to you know, a certain amount of uh, beans and oil and eggs and so on and so forth. But but this has been this has been a major a major change. Uh, this this conversion to what I and other scholars would call a socialist market economy. In other words, what they're trying to do is they're trying to use the market for small sellers. For, for distribution problems, to make sure that there's enough food, et cetera, et cetera. It's great if you like coffee, because there's coffee in every other house for sale. The little tiny cups, it is really good. Um, yeah, it was good for me when I was taking a break from Spanish school. I really needed that little caffeine bit. Yeah, and now we're going to surprise you with the next couple slides. Is this one pretty interesting? This Cuba's New Constitution paves the way for same-sex marriage, okay? And so Cuba, just like the U.S. and other places, has has communities. So we understand that issue, right? We understand that issue here. Cuba has a very articulate community defending the rights of sexual minorities, okay? They're very articulate, and they've been at this constitutional process, and they had a very intense impact on it, and that's what we got. But you know what happened? They took this proposal out to the entire country, and look what happens. Cuba eliminates gay marriage language from the new constitution, right? They didn't, they didn't put in a provision that made gay marriage or homosexual relations illegal. They just left it blank because there was significant opposition all over the country, particularly in rural areas. Does that, does that sound familiar yeah. to, to us? I mean, we were in a, a, a club, and it was, it's an LGBTQ club, and we, it were, you know, a nightclub kind of thing, and everyone was dancing. It was really fun great music and, and so all of a sudden here comes a man, middle age ish, you know, into the club and he goes towards a, a young man who's there and tells him, okay, look, we're, we're leaving now, you got to get out of here. So, of course, this young man didn't want to go and so his friend sort of, you know, made a nice little way of protecting him and the club actually made the, what turned out to be the father made him leave said, you can't come in here and interfere with him. But you could see this was a kind of, you know, I will not allow my son to be a gay boy at a gay club. This is not happening. But they, they kicked him out. They said, you can't do that. Yeah. Interesting. It was very, a very fraught, in the same way that I think we experience in, rural, in the rural US, we have this generational thing, and there's some real strong opposition to, to gay rights. This gentleman here uh, in this picture, he is 
uh, the new president of Cuba, his name is Canal Diaz, and I think he's only been in power for about seven or eight months, and he's leading the effort to take a vote on the new constitution on February 24th, and uh, everything indicates it will get very strong support. Okay. Well, that's it. Do we have some questions? Yeah. Well, I was there under the Obama administration, and um, so it was just when, like, the Airbnb stuff um, and all that kind of stuff, that private sector stuff was developing. Uh, by the way, I found this very interesting, and uh, I learned some new things from your presentation. I didn't realize you could only have two units. I think I was in a place or two that had more than two units. Um, so, and that's in keeping with what I'm about to say. Was there is definitely I had a sense. We spent a lot of time. I was not on a tour. My husband and I just spent a lot of time talking to people. I speak Spanish, so we're able to communicate. And I got the sense that people really, really want to be capitalistic, and um, or you know they want more money. And we ran into bartenders who were attorneys and so on and so forth. And every single one of them said, you can't make a living on the money that we get. You know, everybody works for the government, and except, you know, in this new private sector thing. Everybody works for the government, whether you're an attorney or whoever. And you can't live, literally, they were saying, they can't live on the money they get from the government. So they're all interested in being, you know, bus drivers, cab drivers, and so on and so forth, regardless of, of their training. Now, I want to make it clear, I, I think a lot of stuff they have there, the health care and the education, it's fabulous. Mm -hmm. But I see this, um, this yearning on the part of people to have something that's different. And, and, and one other thing I want to add was, so when we were in these casas particulares of Airbnbs kind of things, sometimes there were, uh, it was just a single apartment, so there was somebody who would come and, you know, make us breakfast and talk to us and stuff. And so we did a lot of talking about things. And, and what we heard about the one of the health things is that they have um, workers in the communities. Not everybody sees a doctor all the time. They have workers, and great idea, community health workers. But that there's there's pressure to like if you're pregnant and you don't go to the doctor, something's going to happen to you. You know, there's you have to do certain well, things. So it's. It's um, sort of dictatorial in some ways. So anyway, I'm putting all that out. I mean, there. I I do know about that, and, and what will happen is someone will come to you. If you don't go to a prenatal visit, somebody will come visit you. Yeah, and and I think in in one sense that's great because your well-being is part of the well-being of the greater good. Right. But it sort of goes against free will. Right. I mean, well, I I I'm not I don't agree with that because uh, hanging out with Cubanos, I I would think yeah. You would have a hard time making them do something they don't want to do, right? People are very outspoken and very opinionated. And if they say, I'm not doing that, they're not doing that. And they, so a health worker might come and say, I want to talk to you because you're pregnant. And uh, they might have a little argument. They might say, I don't want to, so go away. But in general, it's not, this, you, it's not coercive, like these are passive, quiet people just doing whatever they took. No, no, no. That's not the case. They they don't do that. So I mean, I think the notion of free will in Cuba is very very strong. People do have a free will, and one of the interesting things to me is I feel like in 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 terms of things like religion, in terms of things like the newspaper, we get so much misinformation here. You know, like if you listen to to the media here, you would think there's no free press in Cuba. This is not the case. And there are multiple, multiple newspapers in Havana and in Santa Clara. It's not like there's just one state-run source dishing out information. And so, and there's all kinds of ways people express their, um, their freedom. What I found in response to what you said, Patty, is that when people say we want more money, they are serious, they want more money. That does not mean that they don't have what they need to exist, right? And that's the same thing for us, is we have, many of us have what we have to exist, but we would like to also have, you know, and some travel. We'd also like to have a washing machine. We'd also like to have some of these things that are not basic necessities. So when people would say to me, oh, we can't make a living, I'd be like, are you hungry? Do you have food? Do you have shelter, electricity? Oh, well, yeah, of course. 
What are you talking about? Of course we have that. So, but we don't want that. We want a blender. And a blender is expensive, you know? And that's going to be like 20 bucks, and we don't have 20 bucks. So, so that kind of stuff is, is, the definition of these words is pretty loose, I think, in, in many ways. In, but of course, I mean, if you've met your basic needs, people want other things. Yeah. Go. Do you think that the American influence or Western cultural you know, influence has any part on that? Or do they have like access to American pop culture and things yeah. like oh, that? Yeah. Yeah. So perhaps that And it does. A shadow you yeah. know, what they feel because we're you know, a capitalist society and right. you know, we have all these Abundance of Absolutely. Yeah. And there's a lot of big people coming and going from Cuba. It's not easy to travel as an individual, but people go on, you know, trips to perform and do stuff, all kinds of things. So and when we were there they were rolling out the internet trial. So we had four days of free access to the internet because they were doing a trial. Of course it was a trial, so half the time it didn't work, right? But that's what they did it for to see how it was gonna work. But now as of October People have internet in their homes. Is it free still? Or? No, you still have to buy a little card and pay for time. Go ahead. Um, I was just, I kind of had more of a, a philosophical comment kind of that I think wouldn't it give you more freedom to have the ability to earn an amount and buy what you want instead of having something given to you because the stuff that is being given to you don't you inherently have less freedom because you're relying on someone to give it to you. Well, you know, that's a good and it's a fair question, but you know the thing is that everybody in Cuba works, right? Yeah. It's a full employment society, so so you're you're expected, right? Whether you're an orchestra leader or whether you're a street sweeper, you're expected to work, right? Yeah. And as a citizen of Cuba, you're entitled to all the benefits that the Cuban state uh, can offer. Um, in terms of the first part of your question, that's a real interesting one because I think we're going to we're going to see a lot of arguments about this because what you're suggesting is basically the normal way that people try to accumulate wealth in our society. They go out there and do it as individuals, whereas I think Cubans as a whole. Basically, they want you know they want all those kinds of things that, that we like, but they want to share them. They, they want to share them. They they see they see the wealth of the, of their society as something that needs to be distributed in a fair and equitable way for for everyone. And they kind of you know it varies from person to person, but humans kind of reject the model and I'll use the term possessive individualism that we have in our society. And I, I just think that your comment about maybe they want a blender, like, it's just those things, having the right to maybe earn extra luxuries, because, I mean, getting by and living a happy life are two different things. So if you're, like, if you're given everything you need to live is one thing, but being able to, like, earn luxuries, such as, like, we, you know, we take, like, like an iPhone or something, is still nice. I think everyone around the world would enjoy being able to earn luxuries, and, and they work. And but being able to get that the blunder they want besides just what they have. And it's totally available. And make no mistake, if you go into the shop where they're selling blunders, you will have to line up. You, it's not you know people have have enough money to buy blunders. It's just not something that you can get as part of your state subsidized employment, right? That's just not going to be part of that. So, and you know, if you go in a shop where there are things that you might actually need, like <coughs> bowls and buckets and plates and underwear, that stuff is so cheap, so cheap. So that you can easily afford without difficulty. Um, but yeah, I just picked on a blend, I don't know why. Well, you, said, well, you mentioned that they said maybe they don't have the $20. So right, because 20 US is, is quite a bit of money. Mm -hmm. So what if they had more of a chance to, to earn that? Debt? Well, that's what they're doing with constitutional reform, is okay. they're making that opportunity available. But what was interesting to me is when you talk to Cubanos, what they say is, look, we don't want to change from our system to yours. Are you crazy? Mm -hmm. No way, you know? <laughs> 
We want to keep what we have. We still want to have where everybody has what they need. And we still want to have where the arts are available through, through government sources and, and communications and so on. But we also want to be able to do other things. And that's the big thing, isn't it? Is once that influence comes in, what's going to happen? I just want to add to that really quickly is that a lot of the things that we take for granted now, like the internet and stuff like that, the Cubans wanted that too. And when, when a question like that comes up, the Cubans will solve it, but their, their, their criteria always is, is that everybody's got a benefit, right? And so eventually with the internet, you know, you know what happened at first, it was just in the big hotels, right? And then decided we, we can't do it in everybody's home, but let's do it in all the big public parks in the city, right? So, you, you know, we would go there and there would be hundreds of people sitting in a park with their iPhones, right? And then eventually... In the middle they, of the night, because it was right. hot. <laughs> and then, you know, eventually, they figured, eventually they figured out how to get internet to everybody, which exists now, right? That's the kind of the way you do it, step by step. And the criteria always has to be, what do the people need, right? So we, we don't want to, like, just serve one part of the population, we want to serve everyone. I just have to add one thing really quickly. Our Cuban friend said, when I talked to her about all these people doing, looking at their phones in the park, she said, oh yeah, people used to go to the parks to make out, now they go to the parks to get the internet. <laughs> I would like to add, uh, or like say something about, so, you know, I want to refrain from talking about, you know, what is luxury and, you know, what is needed and you know, what should be bought. But I think a really good, you know, point which you made was about, you know, giving people things for free versus making them work for it. And I think that, you know, predicates on the point, like in Cuba, like, you know, like you said, everybody works. And I think, you know, labor is valued more fairly as compared to America. So, for example, I work eight hours a day and I get health care because I'm a full-time employee at colleges. But an Uber driver who works for maybe 15 hours a day does not get that health care, you know. So our labor is very differently. That doesn't mean, you know, I mean, I'm sure that person is, the Uber driver is working much more hard than I do. But I get more benefits even though, you know, I'm not working that hard. So I think like that just says... And nothing's like, free in Cuba. Everybody works, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. right? So everybody works. Um, question, what about people who can't work, like folks who are disabled or... Um, folks who like aren't able to do that or and also like how is mental health treated? Um, That's a really good question. Yeah, I mean if you have a disability they will do everything to find an occupation for you to pursue, right? Because that's the model. But if you can't, you can't. That's how it is, right? And certainly if you're elderly you are not required to work, right? You have access to elderly day places where you can go and, I don't know, drink coffee and play cards and play music and stuff. But, but like that. So mental health is interesting because the, there isn't such a thing in Cuba as really psychiatric wards in hospitals. The hospitals are much more specialized. So like maternity hospitals are separate from other hospitals and mental health hospitals are separate also. But by far the majority of mental health um, treatment is done outpatient. So, and they do it primarily by outreach workers who go and check on people and stuff like that. So, um, it's it, it, the way they do it. Do they have a low bar for diagnosing things like major depression? That I don't know. You know, I mean, I know that, that most countries don't have the level of major depression that we have. We have about four times other rich countries. So my suspicion is that Cuba is somewhere further down in that graph and slowly creeping up. As inequality increases, it will start to, to creep up. But I don't have the sense, visiting those um, psychiatric hospitals, that they, their preference is not to keep people in hospital. Their preference is to have people as outpatients and have people go outreach to them. Yeah. Is there any degree of like chemical dependencies in order to experience illness? Are people addicted to stuff in Cuba? Rum. Oh. <laughs> Rum. Yeah. No. I mean, you. You. you it, the penalty for having marijuana is very severe. Mm. So people do, of course. You yeah. know, young people do, but not a lot. I mean, and you have to well, seek it out to find it. We maybe went to eight or ten different parks in the city. Can that smell marijuana anywhere? So, 
free me. And, you know, what? I mean, I'm sure that there are people who access other forms of substances, but I, I think the degree is much less. And this is part of like the sense of repression, right? Yeah. Isn't it a very large producer of tobacco, though? Cuba, they do produce I mean, so tobacco. Nicotine is the kind of <coughs> they people do smoke, I mean, not so much cigars. People do smoke know, cigarettes. A chemical dependency would be nicotine. nicotine. Yeah, much less than than I expected, and probably much, much, much less than say if you're in Vietnam or if you're in Korea. Compared to here, depends where you are socioeconomically. Here, you can be in a lot of smoking, or you can be in. Rich people here don't smoke either. So. Their cigarettes don't have the chemicals that the cigarettes here have. So that's yeah. the other reality of that they they don't spray they don't as no much. it's it's pure it's strong stuff but it <laughs> doesn't have the mix. And and Fidel, you know, as far as my understanding, which is obviously limited, is was a big big proponent of um, reducing environmental toxicity in Cuba. That was one of his big um, pieces that he engaged in. Go ahead. Um, Fidel also, uh, as he got older, led the struggle and encouraged people in Cuba to quit smoking. So, you know, for what it's worth, I mean, if, if people are, are worried about a repressive regime, which is a, something to consider, here was Fidel himself saying, we make this, it's something we can sell internationally, but it's unhealthy and you shouldn't be smoking it. Uh, but he didn't say you couldn't smoke it, you know, just, just think about your own health. Yeah, I know, but the fact is, if you go deeper, he did something else. I wanted to comment on the question of mental health. I'm a therapist in private practice here in the United States, and one of the things that I drew a lot of inspiration from um, is that in Cuba, there is a model, and there has been for years, of really people who could not go back to the community, like schizophrenics and so on, who needed real a sheltered situation. Uh, great efforts were, were taken in Cuba to help them find some way to work because it contributes to the dignity and the sense of connection of the person with a mental illness to the larger community. And that underlines to me the basic humanism of the revolution, which has nothing to do with people getting rich, but everybody being able to live with dignity. I think we're at time. No, we have three more minutes. Go ahead. Oh, okay. Go so, ahead. So, uh, it's kind of wonderful how Cuba is um, with their own doctors or um, to other countries and helping other countries out. How does this um, new um, situation with Venezuela impact um, the international doctors in Cuba? It's an excellent question. The question is around the fact that there are uh, easily a couple of thousand doctors working in Venezuela, not all Cuban doctors, not only practicing medicine, but training physicians in Venezuela. So there's a whole program called the Barrio Health Program that Cubans basically run. And how is that going to be impacted? I don't know. But I think it's going to be really serious. And then with the whole I don't know about that. The things that people are missing are things that are exclusively manufactured in the United States and they have trouble accessing. So I'll give you an example. The, the plastic bags that we use to put packed red cells when you're doing blood transfusions are a specific kind of plastic. It's very hard for Cuba to get those. They don't make them and they're only made in the United States. So if that's one that's really hard. So that probably won't help with that. It's not a question of money. And I don't have the sense that it's a question of money to, to access things like that. Um, they, you know, they don't prescribe as much as we do. You know, we're kind of medicine happy in our world. They, they're not as medicine happy, but they do. But if you do need something, you probably will access it. Go ahead. Yeah. So was this the Spanish program that you went to? Was that, was that part of Seattle Central, or was that on your own? No, it's, it's a private institute, right? And we just 
basically found them on the internet and vetted them and found out how to make it work and the school supported the grant and it was fine. Yeah, Craig had an internet programs grant, which is, if faculty don't know, it's an awesome, awesome grant. You can take it once every three years, apply for it, and it's $2,500. There's a May Day Brigade going to Cuba, so anybody who has time in the middle of next quarter, you can just Google online May Day Brigade to Cuba and uh, get information on that, uh, it's very low cost. So it's a way for people to get over to Cuba for a couple of weeks. And the, the May Day every year is a big deal in Cuba. It's a huge parade and speeches and all that. That's, it's pegged to that. Did, did the uh, um, friendship, the friendship caravan already leave? They okay. go. They go in the summer, summer, so they are going this summer. Yeah. They're doing. Uh, they're going to Havana and also somewhere else. I don't remember. So folks are interested in that. From where? From Seattle? Yeah. And well, they awesome. travel from all over, and then they. Yeah, go. I did that trip um, with the French caravan, and it's fantastic, absolutely fantastic, because you get to talk to people at all levels uh, in Cuba. Yeah, it's really worth doing, and I think it cost me. The cost was sixteen hundred dollars. Plus your airfare to Mexico City, because you meet in Mexico City and you travel from there. Yeah. The Bay Day really Brigade is under 700 but you have to pay your airfare. That's what I mean by much less expensive. Wow. So I would like you all to join me in thanking our presenters.